it's my pleasure to announce the second talk for the second day of the Kubert Summit. Now we have Lee and Marcello talking about benchmarking the performance of CPU pinning using different virtual CPU topologies, a KVM versus Kubert analysis. Lee and Marcello, it's all yours. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, Marcelo uh, will cover the, both the introduction and the motivation part. Um, um, he will talk about the CPU pinning benefits and drawbacks. And also he will list the different scenarios of virtual CPU topology and the, the configuration and the goal of each scenario. And after that, I will uh, talk about some interesting characteristics of uh, hyperthreading and uh, how you can actually do a uh, covert uh, CPU pinning and topology with just a simple YAML and followed by some of our experiments. And we also verified uh, the previous re reported uh, CPU pinning issues in Covert. And, uh, and we will close the uh, presentation with some final considerations and uh, summary. Um, now we'll pass it to Marcelo. Okay, so just a very short introduction. Uh, everyone knows what CPU pinning is. Um, it's we are you know dedicating and then doing one-to-one -one mapping of the virtual CPUs from the VM to the physical CPU in the physical host. So it's done for several reasons. Uh, you know, one of the reasons is performance. So we have some application that it's CPU intensive and its performance, you know, and latency sensitive and CPU pinning will improve the performance of the VM, especially because it will, uh, you know, reduce the competition of resource of a different process, running if different VMs running in the same, uh, if all the VMs are pinned, but you run the same host. So it can prevent some OS noise and prevent some context switching. Uh, at least it will uh, meet, uh, reduce a little bit the context switching for the set of only for the set of uh, very physical CPUs that the VM will have access. So, and the other, uh, you know, motivation for have CPU pinning is to isolate VMs. Uh, public cloud is doing that. So they create VMs and isolate in, not only for performance, but especially for security. So CPU pinning, it's something that uh, many people are using. Um, however, it has some drawbacks, uh, especially for balance the load. So the operation system will not like uh, load balance anymore the uh, the load across all the physical CPUs, uh, and then this can be a challenge also to define to you know in a system, for example, Kubevir, that is creating a lot of VMs and define uh, what's the best CPU pinning, and we will talk about that. Um, spe most especially for the new release of Kubvert, as uh, Fabian introduced it before, with something actually Roman actually created the new uh, CPU pinny uh, code in the new Kubvert, uh, you know, release. Okay, so regarding CPU pinning, something that it's important that comes is the VM topology. Okay, so this is especially important when doing CPU pinning. So because it will affect the performance of the VM. Uh, when you are creating the virtual topology in the VM, the, the VM can have, for example, virtual hyperthread or not, or disabling hyperthread only have like cores in the VM. And this uh, virtual topology impacts the performance. And this is one of the motivations that of our experiments in, in this presentation, okay? So Lee, can you go to the next slide? Okay, so given that we have like, uh, we can have, you know, virtual hyperthread and and not, you know, our disabled virtual hyperthread have different virtual topologies. And even the host, we can disable hyperthread and have only the cores. So what's the best, you know, topology, the best configuration for performance and, and, uh, that we can we can have with that. So this presentation we're going to drive through, you know, just different topologies and talk about performance. Yeah, Lee, can we go to the next? Okay, so 
this is the baseline, what we call perfect topology matching. We have the VM topology, the virtual topology, the same as the physical topology in the host. For example, here we have a host with one socket and it's a you know theoretical host here. So only two cores and each core has uh, enabled two hyper threads and the virtual topology has also the same configuration, okay? So this will be used as the, our baseline configuration to compare to the other scenarios. We have another scenario where we the host, uh, we disable hyperthread, and but the VM has hyperthread enabled. Then we want to, you know, measure here what's the impact. Whether the guest OS has thinks that they have hyperthread, but there is no hyperthread in the host. You, you can go next. The next one is actually no hyperthread at all in the host and neither in the VM. And we want also to show what's the, you know, compared to the baseline when, er, you know, everything has hyperthread. We can go next. The next one is actually we have hyperthread in the host, but the, v, the VM topologist is not aware about the hyperthread. It's only cores in the VM. And we want, it's like a mismatch in the topology. We want to show how it will be the performance. Next, it's like a, a plus, you know, since we are doing CPU pinning, it's possible also to pin uh, CPUs from different uh, NUMA nodes, different core uh, sockets. And, uh, you know, NUMA nodes, everyone probably is very aware about, about that, but uh, it will, the, each CPU have access to more memory bandwidth because they have different, you know, memory regions and also less level cache. Okay, next. Okay, the, the, the another scenario that we want to show here is what we call mismatching hyperthread allocation. So this is, this is the, the, the problem that, uh, you know, a previous presentation, the KVM forum have before the change that we had in CPU pinning in the kubevert, and it was more or less random, not, not random, but kind of random allocate CPUs when it was doing pinning and then was not matching the topology, the virtual, the hyper thread. Um, and then we will show the performance when we have the scenario. Okay, the next. Okay, so the, the next one, it's to illustrate, you know, because we are talking about, about a lot about hyper thread here, host, you know, disabling host hyper thread. So this is the, it's to show the benefit of hyper thread, you know, even though hyperthread has, uh, of course, as expected, is lower performance than one core, hyperthread is important, especially for this scenario here, when, for example, an application can access two cores when we disable hyperthread in the host. However, if we enable hyperthread, the application now can access two, you know, uh, I would not say virtual here because we mix with the concept of virtual machine, but two, uh, four other cores, you know, uh, in the host and how hyperthread, you know, allows the, to in increase the performance for our application when we can run more. And increasing more hyperthreads not allows only allows application to run more threads, but also to run more VMs in a node. Okay, just to keep in mind that. The next one. Okay, so the the next one we want to compare, you know, the performance of the perfect matching scenario with Pini against KVM versus Kubvirt, just to show, you know, uh, how both are using Libvirt to create VMs. So it's the same thing, same versions. Uh, however, Kubvirt is running a Kubernetes cluster and inside a container, and we want to, you know, highlight what's the performance difference here. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you, Marcelo. I guess this is my part now. Um, I will talk about some background about Hyperthread. I guess uh, the uh, first natural question to ask is, um, why do we need to use hyperthread? Um, so um, I think this might be obvious to you. There are uh, certainly there are a lot of issues related to hyperthreading, like uh, cache thrashing, where threads are competing for those low-level caches. And also some previous studies actually have um, proved that um, uh, hyperthreading has um, higher latencies compared to a dedicated physical core. Um, but um, they also come with some benefits. 
I read a paper actually was uh, written by Intel uh, quite a long time ago. Uh, the basic idea is they add an extra extra set of registers. Um, they only increases the the die size by less than five percent, but with potentially more than thirty percent gain. Uh, that means um, they add less transistor count with uh, more throughput. This is quite important because uh, traditionally, if you wanna let's say increase the uh, CPU performance by thirty percent, you might need uh, more than thirty percent of a transistor count. That's actually uh, not very power efficient, um, which means that you might get more uh, bills on the electricity cost. And uh, another obvious uh, benefit is that you can run more VM uh, per node, as uh, Marcelo said. So for e experiment, we ran the micro benchmark, uh, NASA parallel benchmarks, with those uh, computational kernels and some uh, pseudo applications. They're basically doing some sort of a matrix uh, computation and, uh, tasks uh, uh, using uh, CPU intensively. I wrote a simple bash script to automate the whole task where you can actually modify the um, uh, XM file on the fly and launching the VMs, uh, running the benchmarks inside of uh, for multiple times. For each of the scenario, we uh, run two parallel tasks except for one experiment uh, where we wanted to see how much uh, throughput gain from hyperthreading. So we allocated two cores with, uh, with uh, hyperthreading on compared with uh, two cores with uh, hyperthreading off. So for the first case, we, we run four parallel tasks uh, compared to two tasks. So we want to see uh, how much gain we get. Uh, here is our test bed. Um, for the host, we got uh, 32 vCPUs, so 32 RAM. Um, so we, we got uh, two NUMA nodes on this host where we have uh, two sockets and eight cores uh, per each socket and where you can enable or disable hyperthread. Uh, for the VM, uh, most of the cases were uh, allocating four vCPUs with an eight gigabyte of RAM with a pre-allocated disk image. For the OS uh, host, we're using Ubuntu, uh, but uh, for the guests, we're using OpenSUSE. Uh, the reason uh, for this is because for the uh, previous talk, um, uh, and KVM, um, I collaborated with a SUSE engineer, so uh, I'm too lazy to, to change uh, to a different OS. Um, so I just uh, stick with the SUSE uh, distribution. I, I, I hope it doesn't really make much difference. Um, but it's important actually to, for us to um, make sure the QEMU and the Libre version are consistent with the, the one that's shipped by Kubert, so we can have an apple to apple comparison. Um, this is what you can do actually covered uh, CPU pinning uh, with just a, uh, and also a top topology configuration with a very simple YAML file. Um, <clears throat> um, and here is our result of the first uh, uh, comparison. We compared, uh, compared the baseline with uh, scenario two where let's say you have, uh, you disable the hyper threading on the host side but enabled the uh, uh, hyperthreading uh, inside of the guest. Um, I was expecting uh, the impact should be minimal, which is actually true for most of the test cases. Uh, however, uh, for some uh, strange reasons, this MG benchmark uh, is showing quite a bit of um, um, performance uh, gain, which is uh, interesting. Something I don't really understand, but uh, in a good way. At least it's, it, uh, it tells us it's safe to go with um, a perfect matching uh, case. Uh, similarly, for this case where we have um, uh, hyperthreading disabled on the host as well as uh, inside of the guest. So we have a matching uh, topology. Uh, again, this uh, impact is uh, very minimal, um, um, but the MG shows some interesting uh, performance uh, differences out there. Um, things got really interesting where let's see you uh, have the hyperthreading turned on in the host, but what if you turn on uh, turn off the hyperthread inside of the VM guest? Uh, this is where you have a mismatch in the topology, and uh, um, this is actually a real issue because uh, the guest scheduler uh, is not hyper hyperthread aware, so there is a fifty percent of chance uh, that you have a sibling contention. So as you can see, that the performance drop is quite significant. Uh, which up to 35%. Uh, another scenario is we uh, um, put, uh, we pin the, the CPUs to different socket. So uh, the benefit of that is um, those um, tasks can access to uh, more of those uh, uh, lower level caches. 
uh, also with higher memory bandwidth. But uh, since our application is quite small, we expect this uh, memory bandwidth won't make much difference. But then you can see uh, for both uh, integer sort and this congruent gr gradient, um, they are showing quite um, um, uh, a big uh, throughput difference. The reason is because um, uh, they require inter-process communications uh, when we're running those two tasks. So you need to access data from remote mem uh, memories uh, from a different NUMA node that give you quite a bit of a performance penalty. Um, for scenario six, we're comparing the case where uh, what the Kubert uh, issue they had in the past where you have a, a totally uh, mismatching uh, uh, hyperthread allocation. Uh, we're basically forcing the siblings to compete with each other for the resources. So for all the benchmarks, uh, you can see there is a significant uh, performance um, drop uh, uh, up to like 30%. Uh, for scenario seven, uh, seven, this is the case where we want to um, 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 check like uh, how much uh, throughput uh, we get uh, through gain we get uh, from uh, hyperthreading. So we are comparing uh, 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 two thread uh, uh, with two cores, like with hyperthreading enabled, uh, and then we disable the hyperthreading by only allocating to dedicated cores. So this is uh, throughput gain you get, as you can see, this uh, EP benchmark, uh, which is called. Uh, um, embarrassed the parallel. The reason you're getting 60% 60, 60 of performance gain is because uh, uh, they also call it a perfect parallel because uh, the, uh, the task set really requires little or almost no communication. This is quite important for some tasks like uh, image processing because um, um, uh, you can just uh, process those individual frames independently without uh, uh, any dependency. Um, Lastly, which is something uh, most of you might be very interested uh, wanting to know, uh, what is the difference between uh, running a KVM VM and covert VM? So uh, as you can see that the performance difference is really small, but we run uh, multiple executions. Uh, those performance difference always exists. So we suspect the reason is because uh, um, in Kubert, um, Kubernetes components uh, are running a lot of background processes like um, a Kubernetes agent or container D, which uh, might be competing um, resources um, with uh, the VM uh, CPUs. So for our final consideration, if you really want to take this um, um, CPU pin into the next level, uh, what we suggest that uh, you can actually either use ISO CPUs or CPU set. Uh, um, for the kernel um, boot parameters, you can actually isolate those CPUs uh, from the host uh, scheduler. So in a way, it minimizes the CPU preemption. And also, um, I found out that uh, when you have this dedicated CPU placement enabled, it also actually uh, have, uh, enabled this KVM hand dedicated uh, thing, uh, which is some sort of a power virtualization. Um, uh, allow, uh, the guest is kind of aware they're running on top of KVM. Uh, but we don't know how much uh, performance impact this has. Um, I talked to one of the uh, maintainers and they said um, uh, this thing didn't really go very well. Another thing you could do is uh, you can actually uh, uh, use this ISO, uh, isolate emulator thread, which uh, reduces a lot of contention. And also you can um, increase the huge pitch uh, size, which allows you to do faster pitch walk, uh, as well as reducing the TLB pressure. Um, so just to summarize, I think uh, matching the host topology with the guest is really important. And the virtual hyperthread benefits from a certain workload, not for all kinds of workloads, um, as our benchmark result shows. And the performance drop can be significant if done incorrectly. Um, so another uh, uh, set note is that uh, KVM offers you full control um, tuning. Um, um, compared to Kubert, uh, which makes the best effort uh, tuning automatically. So there is essentially a trade-off on you want to choose, like whether you want to do things more automatically or you want to do things manually. So uh, as usual, there is no uh, solution, uh, one solution uh, solve all the problems. So you need to make the trade-off. And the last, I think the pinning issue is indeed fixed, which is uh, quite a good uh, news. Um, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you all for listening. Um, feel free to ask any questions. Yeah, indeed, there was a there was a great presentation. Thanks, Yuli and Marcelo. Okay. I don't see any question right now. 
but I have one regarding to the difference dif the last case where you were uh, were checking pure KVM right. and Qbert. Um, I think I saw on the Qbert some settings where you could fully isolate also the Qbert components and the system demons ah. from the rest of the workload. I think the OpenShift performance operator does something like that. Did you look into that also? Uh, not really, but that's really interesting. If that's the case, I think we could uh, inim eliminate all those noises, uh, noises, right? Yeah, that, that, that would be really cool also for, uh, for real-time performance, I think. It would be really right, nice to have that. Right. Yeah, don't see any other question. Uh, except that Vladik is saying, as an answer to my question, we can't isolate the virtual launcher code and live virtual D in the launcher. This is definitely true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another question from question from Ish is coming in. I'm unfamiliar. I'm unfamiliar with the benchmarks. Which of them were most meaningful to pay attention to? Um, I think those of the most meaningful. Uh, uh, benchmark is called the EP, which is uh, in, in, embarrassingly parallel. That that basically uh, is the benchmark that requires no dependent dependencies um, between tasks. So this is actually quite a good uh, example for uh, what I said in the example called, uh, uh, the presentation called the image processing tasks. Um, yeah, that's one one of them. And uh, another thing is. Uh, some of them actually do require some sort of like uh, um, dependencies, like inter-process communications, which uh, can be a good representative for uh, general applications, I think. Yeah. I'm not sure so if I uh, answered the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please respond if you want more details. Um, uh, and if you like, I can also give you, you can also get microphone access. Okay, seems like, yeah, seems to be answered okay. Yeah. Okay, great. There is no other question coming up. So Lee and Marcelo, thank you again for the great talk. And we will be back 10 minutes past four UTC time. That's in roughly 13 minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marcina. Okay. Thank you, Roman.